so I've taken uh, experienced cave divers in there and they've said it's intimidating. It's an intimidating penetration dive. You could do hundreds and hundreds of dives on it and still have not explored every, every compartment and every area. Off Gassing, a scuba podcast with host Nick Hogel. When searching for side mount diving on the internet, it's impossible not to come across Andy Davis and Scuba Tech Philippines. On this week's episode, I sit down with Andy and hear some of his thoughts on wreck diving, gas density, foundational skills, advice for divers moving into the technical world, and of course, side mount. I hope you enjoy. Andy, welcome to the podcast. Nice to be here. So... Uh, I guess we'll just start, and if you could just tell me a little bit, uh, and all the listeners out there, a little bit of your diving history. Cool. So I've been diving uh, for three decades. I've been a technical diver for two decades, or uh, just coming up on that. I've been an instructor for about 18 years now, and a technical instructor for for most of that as well, most of that time. Uh, Worked in the UK uh, and across Southeast Asia, Now, now in the Philippines for... A long time. Awesome, awesome. What uh, agency are you training with currently? Uh, I've been an instructor for five different agencies. I'm currently with RAID. Okay, how's that going? Great. It, um, they're they're, uh, they're trying their best to, to, to offer like a higher standard of, of training. So I, I find that the curriculum and the syllabus and the standards kind of match my aspirations to deliver like better quality training. Awesome, awesome. So as far as training... Are you specialized in anything? Is there certain areas that you like to train in more? Yeah, 2009, 2010, uh, I first got into side mount uh, diving. A guy that I worked for was uh, uh, like an early side mount diver and a cave diver, and he kind of got me involved in that, and I, it seemed like a good idea for wreck diving, which, which I love doing. And I just got the bug for it, and it's like uh, uh, almost exclusively diving side mount since 2010, so it's been a, it's been a while now. Awesome. So, uh, one of the reasons, well, me- one of the many reasons I wanted to bring you on to the podcast is you're pretty well known for your blog that you have out there. And I just wanted to ask, you know, what was the driving force for you getting into writing blogs? Is there a passion for writing? And then it just kind of bled over into the other passion for diving? Or is it just something, you know, you wanted information to get out there? What, what's, a, what's a driving force behind the blog that you put out? All of the above, really. I started my, my website, Scuba Tech Philippines. It was initially, when I started working as an independent tech instructor here in the Philippines and across Asia, traveling around, and I needed, you needed a website. I, yeah, I just had that idea to, 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 to bolt on a blog to, to the website so I could do some writing. It, it grew from there, so it, it's, it's been 13 years nearly running the blog. Oh, okay. um, trying to put content out there that maybe has an influence to, to try and help improve the, the dive industry. I've got a, a category of, of side mount articles that a lot of people, I get a lot of positive feedback because when I started side mount diving, there was no really good information online. And I think that the, the, was the early focus of my blog. People were having to work a lot out for themselves and were d- doing a bad job of it and reinventing the wheel. Every instructor was reinventing the wheel. And I just thought I could, I could help out a little bit and that that merged into writing on technical diving subjects and more recently i'm putting a lot of information out there for, for recreational level divers and uh, it's stuff that you you don't get from the manual or, or you don't hear from the, like a typical ins- instructor when you're out uh, and there's a lot of information that divers can benefit from knowing that i it isn't taught as standard and like mainstream agencies people seem to be very responsive to that awesome just a random question. So when was the last time you actually did a recreational single tank dive? Can you remember? I, I did. Uh, we, we, we suffered quite a bit here <laughs> during the pandemic. We, we had a very long and draconian lockdown uh, here in the Philippines. And it was uh, l- later in 2021, after we shut down in early 2020, uh, uh, it was the longest period since I was a teenager where I'd not been able to dive. Uh, I, I've never gone a year more than a year without uh, without diving even when I was in the military when I was serving overseas I always managed to get some dives in tourism hadn't restarted you still couldn't enter the Philippines easily so 
Uh, there wasn't much work as an instructor, but I did some dive guiding <laughs> as, a, as a dive master for the local uh, the local dive centres here, just to just to get in the water af- after after a very long, boring uh, yeah sort of eighteen months or so. Uh, and and that was great. Single single tank is not something I do very often. <laughs> get get my I've got a single single tank wing. Uh, you know I, I I use the same uh, configuration for side mount. Uh, Back mount is always long hose, short hose, uh, uh, Hogarthian style. But that poor wing uh, like, like sits in a crate in my house uh, <laughs> year after year and, and, and very rarely uh, gets wet. So it was, yeah, it was nice. Change is as good as a rest. Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> would, you, uh, would you go back to it anytime soon? Maybe the next pandemic? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no. Um, I, I, I love side mount. Um, uh, it, it's, it, it's the utility originally for me was... was uh, I, I'm diving wrecks here, hundreds of dives on some of the wrecks here in Subic Bay, fantastic wrecks. And there are some places you just cannot physically fit into, you can't penetrate through with, with a set of doubles or, or even a single tank, you know, back mount. Uh, not that you, I'd go in, in some, through these restrictions with a single tank. Uh, as soon as I started using side mount, it just opened up like the, these wrecks uh, that I dived hundreds of times. and. Uh, like totally new areas and, and not just getting through restrictions but getting through the restrictions really easily just slipping through uh, spaces that would be impenetrable to a back mount diver as i refined the, the side mount and my approach to it and the configuration i worked out principles uh, of, of how it works it, it's actually a really sublime way of diving it, it's more like free diving the, the cylinders are at your sides they're, they're, they're elasticated budget into you they, they move with you there's no inertial movement um, you're very maneuverable very flexible and I've got a bad back uh, I've suffered a, a few back injuries too much uh, too many contact sports when I was younger and military service and uh, the, the side man also keeps me going in diving uh, if I was having to, to lug back mount doubles everywhere every dive up and down ladders up and down the beach I, I don't know if my back would would have would, would keep going and I, 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 mean, I intend to d- keep diving for decades to come <laughs> and uh, so side mount I think will facilitate that but I, I, I love being on side mount so even compared to a single tank having two tanks on side mount I think is more comfortable streamlined uh, flexible more maneuverable than, than being on a single tank back mount yeah uh, plus I've got the redundancy and I, I with with a bit of a warm up, I can hold my breath for about three minutes in a swimming pool, which isn't bad. I, I don't want to have to do a, a Caesar, an emergency swimming ascent without breath. From, I mean, on, honestly, d- d- deeper than eighteen twenty meters, yeah. I don't think it's actually practicable for most people. So yeah. you're 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 hundred percent reliant on your buddy, and quite often you're diving with with buddies that you don't know. You've been paired with on a boat. They they may be better or worse trained, but more or less responsible. They might not be very observant. They might have poor situational awareness. And a lot of divers haven't practiced emergency skills since they finished their open water course. Yeah. I don't want to be reliant on that as my only recourse because I don't think like a breath, uh, a no gas ascent, an emergency ascent from, I mean, f- from deeper than 20 meters, you're, you're looking at two, two, two minutes plus of ascent time. If if you don't want to get uh, risk getting bent, uh, with Sideman, I've, I've got a complete redundancy. Uh, I've, uh, I've done a lot of dives, so I've, I've experienced real, real life regulator failures. It's just an, an, a non issue. You, you, you can have a complete regulator failure, uh, you can lose all your gas or access to all your gas in, in one cylinder, and, and you've got more than sufficient to, to comfortably ascend. Uh, so it's, it's, it's just a a worry that I don't have diving side mount, the, the redundancy is uh, great. Keeps you uh, uh, stress-free diving. Uh, worst case scenario that you can possibly imagine, it's, it's, it's inherently dealt with by, by the equipment. And diving in a single tank now, I'm, I'm aware that you know, it's, you've got one strike. If, <laughs> yeah. if, if it fails, you, you've got one strike and I better hope your, your buddy's right there yeah. and, and, and observant and actually able to react well to help you. Otherwise, you You've got a long way to go to the surface. So yeah. Certainly 30, 40 meter dives. Oof. Um, I, I, I definitely couldn't come up at a safe speed with no, with, with no gas supply from you know, a, a recreational deep dive 40 meters. Uh, I, I wouldn't dive nowadays 
but for all my experience and being a, a trimix instructor for, for decades, um, I, I wouldn't do a dive deep in 20 meters without redundant gas. I've seen too many failures over the years. It's not a hypothetical and it probably yeah. won't happen to me because it does happen. And when it does, you're either prepared for it or you're not. Yeah. And that's one of those skills that, to be frankly honest, most people probably have not done since their open water course. So they're definitely unprepared. Oh. So I like the gas redundancy, uh, especially because I, I do enjoy side mount as well um, for those you know reasons you know, amongst many other reasons. So I just wanted to, to go into the, the wreck diving a little bit. So mm -hmm. you are based here in Subic Bay. There is a lot of wrecks here. What would you say your favorite wreck to dive in Subic Bay is? The, the signature wreck here is the USS New York. It's uh, an armored cruiser, armored cruiser number two, ACR two, US Navy. It was the flagship of the US South Atlantic Fleet, I believe it was a flagship in its day, uh, pre-battleship era. I think it, it was it was launched in the late 1800s and upgraded uh, around the time just before the First World War. They put big turrets and uh, big guns on it. Uh, it was here at the beginning of World War II, and uh, it was outdated by that point. Uh, the U.S. Navy scuttled it in Subic Bay rather than let it fall into the Japanese hands because they could have used its guns against the American forces that were holding up on the Bataan Mountains, which kind of overlook uh, Subic Bay. Uh, so, so you've basically got, I mean, like, essentially sort of a, an early battleship um, led at 30 meters. It's inside a very protected bay. It's phenomenal to dive. Uh, you, you can go from, from like, a, a, a recreational wreck diver, can do basic penetrations, way up to, to highly, highly technical uh, wreck penetrations with, with uh, a lot of silt, a lot of tight restrictions. So the, uh, to the point where uh, I've, I've, I've taken uh, experienced cave divers in there and they've said it's intimidating. It's an intimidating penetration dive. You could do hundreds and hundreds of dives on it and still have not explored every, every compartment and every area there's as much challenge as you'd ever need for a wreck, so it, that's fantastic. Uh, but, but Subic's also got, um, I mean, we've got five aircraft wreck, we've got military vehicles like half tracks with, with howitzer guns on them, uh, Japanese aircraft, US Navy aircraft, as an F4 Phantom on the outside of the bay, or uh, sunk at uh, 42 meters. Uh, but we've also got some immense training wrecks. One of the reasons I've stayed here was we've got this uh, wreck called the El Capitan, and it was a uh, a logging company, a lumber company, owned it before World War II, and it was drafted into service as a supply ship during, during the war. It won a, a battle star for getting uh, uh, supplies through to the U.S. Uh, uh, US Marines uh, who, who, were, uh, who were trapped on Iwo Jima. They were cut off by the uh, Japanese fleet. Uh, it got torpedoed but didn't sink. Uh, at the end of the war, because it was damaged, they towed it here to repair it. Uh, it during the war, it was the USS Majaba. It was renamed. And they, they were fixing it up to return it to the civilian owners uh, at the end of the war. And it, it actually bizarrely sank in a, in a typhoon. Oh. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it's, it's in a bay within the bay. It's so protected. Uh, so this thing's lying at, at 20, 22 meters. Um, the top of the wreck, it's led on its side. The side of the hull's four meters deep. Any, any wreck not in such a sheltered location would have been dis like torn apart decades ago by, by storms and currents. And I can run my uh, advanced technical rec courses uh, in there where, where we're doing uh, 90 minutes, two hours of, of dive time with, with an average depth of 10 to 12 meters and not even incurring decompression. And every, every dive is, is, is like a long bottom time, like large amounts of training. You, you've done some with me yourself. Yeah. So uh, I, I can like, quadruple the amount of in-water training time on a course compared to if I, if I was somewhere where we had to do our training dives on a wreck that was 20, 30, 40 meters deep. Yeah. Um, obviously, uh, we, we don't need uh, to pay for trimix when, when you're <laughs> at uh, 12, 14 meters. Um, we don't need to pay for deco gases where, where we can be in and out maximizing the training. And I'm not uh, thinking about running my courses in other locations, certainly within Southeast Asia, but I, I, I can't find a wreck that is so perfect for, <laughs> yeah. for the training. Uh, so it's, it's one of my reasons for staying here in Zubik is 
not, not the signature wreck, not the, not the, the most attractive wrecks to dive, although the El Capitan is a lovely wreck to dive, as, as you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, the reason I'm here is a, is a training wreck that facilitates like, like better courses than I could run anywhere else. Cool. So I guess we will head back to the blog portion. Mm -hmm. What would be some go-to, you know, like what would you want to, out of all the blogs that you have, because there's quite a few, is there any one that you would try to get out there for the ones that you think people should read? I, th I think that the, there's two areas that, that I focused on in recent years that that, that really are lacking, uh, certainly on, in, 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 in like the manuals of, of, of diving courses and, 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 and what's being commonly taught. And uh, one of them is the issue of, of gas density. It's something I, I did technical diving for, for, for a long time before uh, I, I encountered this. And I know GUE uh, agency were big on this uh, from, 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 the, from the outset. But I, I, I watched some, uh, one of the leading guys in decompression research is Simon Mitchell. Uh, he, he's got some excellent videos on YouTube, some excellent papers he's published. And a few years ago, they did a study with the US Navy uh, on gas density. And it's literally not mentioned anywhere by, by a lot of diving agencies. And this research is really credible. It's from the US Navy, and it's to do with gas density and uh, CO2 retention. And you, you, you're below a certain gas density, it's very sudden and very sharp. You, you, your body just can't get rid of the CO2. And it's not to do with dead air spaces. It's, 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 it's to do with gas transfer from your lungs. To, to the point where, after uh, with, with Simon Mitchell's work, Dan, the Divers Alert Network, issued recommendations, clear recommendations about gas density, the maximum gas density uh, that the diver should be using. And gas density is determined by the gases you're breathing. And, and with air, uh, it, it's quite shallow. And I think the dive industry ignores that because, uh, by and large, ignores that because it would mean using air for, for tech courses down to 50 meters directly ignoring Dan's recommendations, ignoring the science. People tend to think about narcosis, but completely oblivious to the, the gas density issue. And I believe it probably contributes to, to diving fatalities every year. Just getting Dan's message out there, like trying to make people more aware of this because the industry isn't telling people about gas density. Uh, so I've got blog posts that explain why, what, what the issues are with CO2, CO2 narcosis, panic, uh, CO2, CO2 narcosis is, is, is really strong, really quick. Uh, I, I believe a lot of recreational divers suffer when they think that, when they feel that the narcosis quite often, especially if it's, there's anxiety or panic or inexplicable sort of anxiety on dives, uh, quite often it's CO2 narcosis. And again, it's not educated. Uh, I, I can't think of uh, a, like mainstream agency, uh, where, where I've taught for mainstream agencies, PADI, SSI, uh, where they've ever mentioned really like CO2 narcosis. And if you're doing deep diving, even advanced open water, 30 meters uh, and deeper, uh, the, the gas density limit kind, kind of works out. You, ideally, what, what Dan is saying is it's, it works out about 33 meters deep. It should be the deepest you're air on air. And, and then they've got like an absolute maximum limit. It's 6.2 grams per liter. And with air, that works out about 38 meters. So Deep diving, you're, you're beyond the ideal maximum, and, and you're, you're, you know, you're going to 40 meters. You're beyond the absolute maximum that Dan says you should do. And their, their recommendations, Dan's recommendations on flying after diving are taken as read, promulgated by the agencies. Uh, we, we do this. This is the best science, best, you know, the, the best knowledge we have to date. These are the, the best protocols. Uh, and for some reason, gas density, because it's not convenient for what makes money in terms of selling <laughs> courses, um, it, it, it's just not there. It's, it's, it's just ignored. But it's right up there with flying after diving and a bunch of other stuff that Dan have recommendations on. Um, so, and, and the only thing I can say is, well, C is, is well, it interferes with profits. P people don't want to be told it, they, they can't go deeper on air. It, yeah. It's dangerous. Uh, not because of narcosis. Not because of, you know, you're going to head spin and uh, you might make a mistake. It's like a, physiological reason with gas density of CO2 and, and you might be fine if everything's no, nothing goes wrong and, and you have a nice placid uneventful dive but if an emergency happens and you, you you've got that gas density issue as soon as you start huffing puffing and exerting yourself uh, you, you you're not going to off gas that CO2 it's going to spike really rapidly 
Um, that's going to uh, ha- the, the, the narcosis from that is going to uh, uh, anxiety, panic, uh, and and you, all the stress management in the world that you could stop, think, breathe, you know, yeah. uh, before you act. Uh, uh, that, that's all great, but that's that's a, that's a, a psychological control over your psychology. Whereas it, it, this is CO2 narcosis. It's a physiological effect. You you just can't take a deep breath, calm yourself down. It, it, it's narcosis, and it, it's panic-inducing narcosis. Um, tech, tech dives quite often call CO2 narcosis dark narc, okay. dark narc, because um, it, it, it quite often presents with... Uh, like psychological, this like anxiety and fear. I, it, that, that contributes to a lot of diving accidents. Um, I've had students who've, who've, who've been hit with CO2 narcosis on, on training dives because they've exerted too hard. And they're, they're, they're like, I don't know what happened. I wasn't in control of myself. And I was so close to panicking and I can't explain why. And I see this on the diving forums and the social media groups for diving all the time. People talking about anxiety when they're diving. And it's, it has an explanation. Yeah. But without talking about gas density and CO2 retention, people aren't aware of that. Aren't aware of that explanation. But it, it, and the agencies aren't teaching people because they would have to reevaluate their, some of their training. Yeah. And you have quite, I want to say you have quite a few articles about this subject on there. So definitely a a good one to to look up. And uh, another one I want to bring up is just the training. You have a few training, build mastery of skills. Mm -hmm. Um, Do you want to talk a little bit about those? Sure, yeah. I'm an avid reader. I I think part of my job is to understand how to develop performance. So I, I, as, as an instructor, I, I don't just regurgitate a course and tick off a list of skills. I'm, I'm actually looking at performance development. I, 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 I coach and mentor rather than just teach. And uh, so, so you, th- th- there's a science to a lot of this stuff. There's, there's a body of work. So I'm reading a lot of, uh, of books on the subject I, and, and doing a lot of thinking. I, I recently wrote an article like the difference between experience and expertise uh, totally different things and just this morning uh, a, a diver uh, there's a report uh, a technical diver died in the philippines a korean uh, uh, a technical diver and uh, i've no details on that but the, the news report was he was an experienced diver and i see this all the time he, especially when there's diving accidents uh, they were an experienced diver and uh, just, just question what 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 does, what does that actually mean yeah. To, to be experienced. Uh, if you've got five dives, someone with 20 dives is experienced. You, you could have a thousand dives experience, but on a technical dive, you, you, you might be a beginner. Uh, you might uh, have a handful of dives. I'm, I'm, I've got probably coming on to 11, 12,000 dives experience now, a, a good proportion of which are either overhead environment and, or, or technical uh, dives. I've had the opportunity to go on, on, on like cave expeditions, stuff being invited, and uh, I, I'm inexperienced, a uh, complete noob. Uh, you, you'll never, I, I, I'd never write on, on CCR. I, I, was, I qualified as a, a CCR diver six years ago, but uh, I, I'm in demand uh, for, for teaching for side mount, so don't dive CCR. Um, so I'm completely inexperienced, and you'll, you'll never hear me expressing opinions on that. I'm, I'm, I'm set to receive, I listen, uh, and I listen to other people. Uh, about that so you know what 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 is an experienced diver um there's 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 some interesting work with you know experience and expertise experience versus expertise because uh without self-awareness and and the ability to learn and to be like self-honest to be honest to yourself experience can make you a much worse diver if if you're not correcting faults you you're building bad habits you're you're gaining complacency and there's a term called normalization of deviance which actually arose from the nasa challenger space shuttle inquest where you 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 deviate from what you're supposed to do and nothing goes wrong so that becomes the new norm that uh, and and then you deviate from that further and uh, and that becomes the norm because and eventually when by the time something does go wrong eventually you're so far from where you should be that it's not fail safe. You, you, you're, you're screwed because you're, you're so far away from being, being safe. And I, yeah, that's really observable sometimes in diving. Uh, yeah. So experience could be a really bad thing without the right mindset and attitude. And uh, to a certain extent, people's 
natural traits. So some people are more or less in, uh, introspective or self-aware. It is stuff you can develop. And I've, I've written stuff about self-awareness and developing self-awareness. And th this comes from like academic psychology or clinical psychology, behavioral psychology. Uh, so so it's, it's not like pseudoscience and fluffy nonsense that, <laughs> that, that tends to, to fill up YouTube and blogs. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but developing those factors, uh, there's a guy, Gareth Locke, uh, who, who runs a, a thing called Humor Factors in Diving, and he's got a very good book on the subject and has online courses and physical courses where he goes around. And, I mean, he, he's doing a lot. He, he recently did a lot with the RAID management team, training them up in, in this Humor Factors in Diving. Uh, he, similar sort of stuff, the, the, the psychology, but, but looking deeper into what, the way people deviate a dive unsafely. Uh, and you can't just dismiss stuff as human error or... He's stupid. Why did he do that? That does digging deeper to why people make those 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 stupid mistakes. Yeah. Because we all do them. Uh, we we all make bad judgments. We we all do stuff. Uh, what what differs great divers from from bad divers is is whether you you stop and look at yourself sometimes and, and, and evaluate yourself and evaluate your judgment and and how you're thinking and your mindset. Uh, so yeah, I love writing on stuff like that because I. I see it so often, I see it so clearly amongst divers, different uh, mindsets, attitudes, e even personality traits. Again, not pseudo-psychology pseudo nonsense, but the, the big five personality tests, I recently wrote an article that included some of that stuff. This is what's used in psychological studies. Uh, factors like uh, conscientiousness and uh, openness to experience. Um, really, I, I, and when you, when you start to become aware of those, uh, you can look at divers and, and you, could, you could start to understand how they, they operate as individuals and, and why their beliefs and judgments are as they are, better or worse. And, and, and I believe that if, if you can understand yourself in that respect, you can start to understand your own strengths and weaknesses, psychologically, your personality, your nature. As, as a diver, especially if you're doing high-risk diving, you, you can start to build systems that compensate for your deficits. So yeah. I, I'm not the most conscientious diver in the world. Uh, I'm, I'm prone to, I, I, well, like a lot of people, I'm, I'm prone to complacency. I've done a lot of diving. It's so easy to think, well, I don't need to bother with X, Y, and Z. I know what I'm doing. I've done it a hundred times before. I don't need to take this back up or that or, or bother to do this planning because I know. Uh, and um, because I know I'm prone to, to want to like to, uh, to think I don't need to, I, I, I have to compensate by being more formulaic. So sometimes when I'm, if I'm writing on social media, people like might say, might think that, oh, well, you know, you're, you're such a... a a stickler you're, you're, <laughs> you're inflexible there's uh, you know you, you reach a level of knowledge where you don't need to do the checklists and you, you don't need to follow the, those protocols exactly because with experience and I can look at that and say yeah but, but where, where do you draw the line at what point do you start being dishonest with yourself when does it become imprudence and, and the easiest way for me is, is to be right this is this I'm going to follow like the, 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 the basic stuff talk to basic divers or basic tech divers or basic wreck divers because if I if I don't where, where do I draw the line uh, I, I, could, I could definitely go too far with it yeah yeah uh, but so understanding myself trying to understand myself and I, I don't see enough of that certainly with technical diving now uh, technical diving courses when I first learned I was to a 20 something years ago that, that there was more talk about technical diving mindset and technical diving attitudes and, and I, I I see that kind of, kind of dissolving a little bit. There's, there's a lot more technical divers being trained now by a lot less experienced technical instructors. It's become a lot more popular. People supply meets demand. Yeah. Um, and, and so you've got without that experience, and 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 maybe like technical diving was very self-selecting. Uh, it, it used to be once upon a time like 0.01 percent of divers, and now it's. Uh, I think TDI released some statistics recently, and it's like four to six percent of divers, which astounds me, are, are technical divers, and that's great, but also kind of worrying. But but the, the, the mindset used to be a big thing. Like tiny amount of divers did it. They were very serious divers. There were massive amounts of experience, and you didn't you didn't have all the safeguards you do now, and the technology and the access to to trimix in, in certainly in remote locations. You know, outside of maybe Europe and America, there wasn't like access to Trimix. 
Uh, and if you didn't have a very risk adverse, very diligent uh, mindset and you weren't very self-limiting and patient, uh, didn't have a lot of humility and weren't prepared to slowly, very slowly gain experience and increase your limits and know when to stop for you at your limits because some of them are physiological, gas density again, uh, without, without trimix to, 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 to lower the gas density of the gas, um, people used to, to, to die. But now, nowadays, everyone's got access to trimix no reason to be doing uh, deep air diving uh, anyone can buy a shear water yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and the day, uh, when i first learned tech diving uh, we we had dive planning software uh, there, there were a few computers but most people most tech divers didn't use them the, the old vr2s vr3s uh, they, they, they weren't very good uh, but we, we we dive plan it was it was ms dos dive planning software it was raw bullman Adding, uh, you know, uh, uh, tweaking your ascent profile, longer, shorter, shallower versus deeper stops. Uh, uh, this, this is when pile stops are very, you know, this is just back of a beer mat, adding, adding time <laughs> to your stops. That, and and we, were, we were doing deeper stops, but there, there was no way then to calculate how extending our shallow decompression because of the, the deep stops cause l- slow tissue on gas, more slow tissue on gassing. And, and, and divers uh, used to come up from, from dives and it's like, well, my, my arms feel a bit fizzy. <laughs> I feel a bit fizzy, so I'm going to tweak, uh, you know, again, back of a beer mat with, with, with a biro. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tweak my... And it was, it was literally making it up as you go along. You, you needed a, a large amount of experience and you, you had to start conservative and tentatively become more aggressive. And there's none of that now. You, 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 you can strap on a shear water. You, you, you can even if you don't understand gradient factors, you, you've got some default ones. Um, you, you can put your trimix in. Deal with gas density. Deal with narcosis. De- de- deal with all the, the oxygen toxicity issues. Because I mean, deep deep air diving. Uh, I, I've done 90 meter air dives uh, back in the day. Uh, so so your all your oxygen. Toxicity, your, your 1.4 limits are out the window. Your OTUs, your CNS clock is all out the window. Narcosis is incredible. Complete amnesia um, from co- coming up from the dives. The air is so thick you, you, you can almost chew it. Uh, <laughs> it's cr- crazy. And, 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 and to, to be a technical diver doing that, you, you have to, to be very good or you died. Uh, you yeah. can die very easily. And there's, just, you, there's no need for that. And, and when I see people still doing, I mean, even just 50-meter air dives, for the sake of a splash of helium, especially when they're new and they're not used to the protocols of the, the you know the gas switches, at the risk of screwing up a gas switch because you're, you 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 bring the narcosis up with you from the bottom. Uh, that that's been proven. Uh, there's, there's a few papers, uh, scientific papers, study papers that show that narcosis is persistent. Technical diving can be very safe nowadays, and it's accessible to more people because of that. So, what would be advice that you would want to give? whatever level they're at and they're wanting you know in the recreational level and they want to move into technical what would be some pieces of advice that you you would like to give obviously you've explained some of them but what would be some good key points like do this do that i think that the top three points uh firstly uh you have to be an accomplished diver to become a basic technical diver to be to learn technical diving and when i say accomplished i mean uh, your fundamental skills buoyancy trim propulsion maneuvering your control uh your attention to detail with your equipment uh, you need to be an accomplished diver most people who struggle in, t- in technical diving or fail in technical diving courses it's a lack of fundamental skills quite often there are agencies like uh, GWE, which I, I i think is very admirable but they're, they're not a for-profit agency so they can do this uh they, they have a pass fail fundamentals course uh, that you have to pass t- to do technical training. And I think that's great. And I'm envious of their instructors that when they're teaching tech courses, all their people are above a high baseline of, of fundamental skill. And I think uh, that's a really nice thing for a tech instructor. Uh, otherwise, I have to remediate my students. Yeah. And people come for a technical diving course and find that they might need a couple of days to actually get their basics uh, to, to a higher level before we can start adding complexity so so working on fundamental skills uh, and, and it's hard because there's not many agencies that actually offer training to improve your fundamental skills because uh, the, the basic sort of buoyancy course uh, specialty 
uh, taught by, by a recreational instructor. Um, a lot of in instructors, have, in, in my experience, uh, teaching instructors technical diving uh, ha really uh, are below that baseline for their, for their fundamental skills. So they, ha they can improve people to that level. And these are fundamental skills. They're not technical skills. Being able to hover in horizontal trim uh, you know, w without major deviations in depth and being able to hold a position without drifting off or swimming in circles. Um, this is not technical skills. And I've heard instructors say, oh, that's tech diving. But it's, no, it's, I mean, you're, you're supposed to have mastery of buoyancy control as a water diver, but, but, but that's rarely the case. Um, so, so getting the fundamental skills, be, becoming an accomplished diver, okay. uh, accomplished skill diver before you go to, uh, and talk to, to, talk to tech instructors. Uh, we, we do courses in clinics. They might not be an agency course you get a card for, but you know, coaching, mentoring, paper day, informal training, uh, a lot of tech instructors could do stuff like that or, or go to an agency like GUE or UDT, which, which yeah, the GUE fundamentals course, doesn't matter what agency you are, um, yeah, that, that's become a very popular course and it's, it's a hard course, but I've never seen a graduate from that course, someone who's passed that course with deficit of skill. It's a really good course. The other things, uh, probably uh, when I learned technical diving 20 years ago, you know, I, I went online and I bought every book on technical diving before I did the course. And it was more of an investment back then because courses weren't split into convenient, like, weekend-long chunks. There was no Tech 40, 45, 50. It was, uh, as, as when I first qualified as a, as a paddy uh, tech instructor, the Tech Deep course was one big course, right up to, to Tech 50, all in one. And it was expensive because it was one long course. The learning curve was steep every day. Uh, so you want to be as prepared as possible before you turned up because if you failed if you couldn't keep up with the learning curve uh, and the instructors were actually strict then instead of lowering standards to meet their students performance it was the other way around they, you had to perform to the standards uh, too often that isn't the case nowadays you didn't want to fail the course so I read every book on technical diving that was published at the time and I, I, I read science, you know papers on stuff and oxygen toxicity I, I, I did everything I could to increase my knowledge I, I didn't know too much about fundamental skills when I became a technical diver. I was a dive master. I had about 250 something, 300 dives. I thought I was really good. And uh, my first weekend, my first day in the water, I, I was stick. My head was plunging into the mud because I had no <laughs> trim control, and I tried to do shutdown drills. I'm floating to the surface or face planting <laughs> into the mud. It was really humiliating. I, I, I wasn't anywhere near as skilled as, as I assumed I was. I thought I was compared to other recreational divers. I've got a bit of experience, got a bit of skill. I, I really wanted to, I really wanted to give up. Like I didn't want to go back the next day because serious ego dent. And uh, to be honest, if, if a technical course isn't teaching you that, then then you're probably being ripped off. You're, you're probably being sold a card rather than trained as a technical diver. So. Yeah, the, the, the preparation with fundamental skills, the preparation by reading everything that can be read, investing your time and effort into preparing for that course. You don't just turn up on the course, swipe a credit card, expect someone to, to change you as a diver uh, in, in a week or, or a weekend. Uh, do as much as you can. Uh, research, read the books, read the blogs. There's so much more information freely available now on the internet than there was 20 years ago. Uh, b better books, uh, uh, more modern books uh, being released. Uh, some, some really great resources out there. And, and I think the, the, the third thing is research the instructor. Uh, technical diving, I, I, personally I think even specialty diving, uh, something like side mount or, or even deep diving or, 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 uh, or a rescue course. There's some instructors that are a lot better they have specific subject matter expertise i got a friend who's uh an ex navy corpsman the, the, the guys worked around the world doing, doing stuff with the u.s military skilled and experienced in first aid cpr and well beyond that paramedic skills uh, a, a rescue diver course with a guy like that is going to offer uh, expose you to information and opinions and, and, and judgments and ideas that, that you you won't get from a guy who's just been on a Paddy instructor course and done a, you know, being ticked off as a rescue <laughs> diver, a uh, rescue instructor. You, you can self certify as a rec instructor for, for some agencies. Uh, as an instructor, you could just tell your agency, I've done some rec dives and I want to be a rec instructor, and they pat you on the back and 
authorize you to teach. Uh, wreck diving is incredibly specialist. It's, it's no less risky than, than cavern diving. It's, it's no less sophisticated and complex. Than, than, uh, there's no less risk mitigation needed than cavern intro, intro to cave level diving. Uh, to be a, a cavern instructor for, for the mainstream agencies, you've got to be at least a cave diver or a cave instructor. Uh, for, for REC, which has the same limits, the same risks, the same protocols are actually necessary. If you're going to do a REC course, research your instructor. It's a specialist diving area. Find a specialist instructor, and they do exist. Uh, and the same would be for deep diving. For, for tech, it's really important to research the, the tech instructor. Um, it is possible with some agencies for a recreational instructor to go out. Uh, I've seen it advertised online. Within two weeks, they're, they're a tech instructor. With two weeks, uh, they can cram it all in within two weeks. That, that person is not going to be competent. Uh, it, I mean, in terms of safety, they're not going to be competent to, to supervise and train you and look after you on, on technical dives because they literally have no experience themselves. The added value, and you must know that uh, you, we, we've done stuff together, we've done diving together. Added extras you get with, oh, with, yeah. with experience. The drills that aren't in a, in a book somewhere, the, the, the protocols that aren't necessarily specified anywhere, the best practices that an experienced instructor isn't uh, focused on one agency or just regurgitating what they were taught. They, they, they're, they're picking and choosing. Uh, the old Bruce Lee quote, learn everything, study everything, absorb everything, but, but pick what's useful, yeah. what's best. And, and really good tech instructors do that. Uh, their best practices come from the, the whole tech training, tech community. What you get with your research and, and you go to a truly, and it, it might cost a hundred bucks more to do a course with, 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 with that guy than, than some guy that has zero experience. So your, your research, you, you don't book with the dive center, book with the instructor. If the dive center doesn't even advertise her, who the instructor is, <laughs> it'll teach the tech courses, they're probably maybe not someone that's, that's significant because if you've got a wealth of experience and reputation, then you, your name is going to be on the website. This is who's teaching. Yeah. And if you're doing a lot of tech diving, you, you will have an imprint on the tech community so people will know who you are, you, you've done uh, explorations and expeditions, you've trained a bunch of people, done the dives, you've networked. Because uh, uh, actually, in tech diving, uh, any, any, anyone who's good knows everyone who's good. Yeah, uh, it's a small uh, world. It is. But, but tech diving is much bigger than that now. Yeah. Um, fundamental skills, big accomplished diver, read everything you can, know everything you can before you get on the course, and pick your, your instructor very very carefully a good instructors will communicate you can email message i spend time every day with, with, with students that are coming to me uh go, going through what kit they need to buy what skills they can practice what they can do to prepare i'm, I'm sending emails and messages every day to, to prospective students and if an instructor is not doing that i don't see why an instructor wouldn't do that because it makes my job so much easier when they arrive they've got yeah. the right kit they've got better skills to start with I wouldn't advise someone to go to a tech instructor that they're not talking to for, for weeks or months in advance, uh, as someone who's answering all their questions, guiding them, helping them, so that the course can be as successful as possible. How can I see what you're putting out there? Obviously, Scuba Tech Philippines, but how do I get a hold of Andy Davis? Cool. Uh, well, the, the blog, uh, you can find it at scubatechphilippines.com, all one word. You, you'll probably find me on, I come up in a lot of Google searches, so if you, if you just look for side mount or Subic Bay diving, yeah. <laughs> you, you, you'll find me anyway to, to contact me. Uh, actually, the, one of the, probably the easiest way to contact me is a uh, Facebook group, uh, Scuba Tech Philippines. Uh, just look for me on, um, on Facebook. Facebook Messenger tends to ping away and uh, doesn't risk getting, getting into an email spam <laughs> folder or something. Okay. And any last piece of advice for the divers out there? Be curious. Uh, there's a lot more knowledge and expertise and a lot more ideas or things that, that, that you benefit from knowing that the very bare minimum that might be in a specialty or a tech uh, manual. Look, look for instructors who teach far beyond the manual, but be, be curious. Um, I, I've been writing a blog for a decade. I know some fantastic blogs, podcasts, YouTube channels with, with some real expertise and you benefit from, from, from hearing those expert opinions. You, you, you can learn from, from seeing the mindset and attitude of, of, of high-level advanced divers. What, what uh, a deep course tells you about narcosis is, is 
not even the tip of, of an iceberg. Some of it is, is categorically wrong. The, the, the bad analogy of alcohol inebriation, that there's so much more sophistication, knowledge out there. But, but be curious. Go, go, go out there and read things, buy the books, watch the Simon Mitchell YouTube uh, lectures. Uh, you'll get so much more out of diving and you'll be so much safer for it. So be curious as a diver. Andy, thank you very much for coming on to the podcast today. Offcasting, a scuba podcast.